Good afternoon. My name is Karen Planet. I'm the president of AI Ohio. I'm here to welcome you today to the Practice Innovation Workshop Program, Innovative Technologies Reshaping Practice. This is the sixth and final session of our series in this workshop and uh, that will be presented this year by AI Ohio. I'd first like to recognize and thank our 2021 AI Ohio annual sponsors highlighted on the screen now. Our sponsors are important partners who have helped us bring the innovative and quality programming we have been enjoying this year. I'd also like to thank the Practice Innovation Committee Chair, Melinda Scarfello, and committee members, Bruce Sikanik, Emily Little, Kate Brunswick, and Bill Willoughby, who will lead the who led the development of today's program. There's a lot of work that goes into planning these sessions and they would not be possible without a group of dedicated volunteers. Registration opens for the AI Ohio member recognition celebration to recognize this year's honor award recipients and the contributors of AIO's members to the profession. The event will take place in Columbus on the evening of November 4th. This will be our only in-person event of the year. Seating is limited, so please don't wait till the last minute to register. Registration actually closes Friday of this week. Also mark your calendar now and plan on joining us on Friday, November 19th at noon via Zoom for the AI Ohio annual meeting. It'll be a great opportunity to hear what AI Ohio has accomplished this year, participate in the election of officers and find out what we have planned for next year. Before we get started, there are just a few housekeeping items. Our program today is scheduled for one and one half hours, including some time for Q&A at the end of the program. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. Please make sure your microphones are on mute so that everyone can hear the speakers. Towards the end of the presentation, we'll be placing a link in the chat box, which you can click on to sign up to receive your learning units for today's program. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Now I'd like to turn the program over to Bill Willoughby, who will introduce our speakers and will be the moderator for today's program. Bill? Uh, thank you very much, Karen. Um, uh, my name is Bill uh, Willoughby, and this has been a great uh, committee to have been a part of. I think we've had six really interesting uh, uh, sessions with this being the caboose, uh, but uh, hopefully it will uh, enrich your ideas about how uh, practice uh, can be innovative and be innovated. Um, so we have two speakers, um, Matt uh, Niederheiser, who is the senior associate and the director of innovation at Hall and Basham Architects. Um, Excited to have him here. He is going to start uh, the uh, presentation, and um, uh, we'll 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 have to duck out uh, about uh, half an hour in. Um, but uh, we'll have some time to have some conversation between Matt and and uh, next Nate Holland, who is a architect and senior associate uh, and the director of design innovation at NBBJ out of the Seattle office and also, I guess, out of uh, Nebraska too. Uh, so uh, two locations there. Um, so uh, without further uh, ado, uh, let's get started. Uh, and uh, Matt can uh, begin sharing his screen. Perfect. Get me going. Okay. So uh, good, mor uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as, as uh, Bill mentioned, I'm Matt Niederheiser with Holland Basham Architects. Uh, pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, so kind of, I'll start off with our firm background. So Holland Basham Architects, we were a 50 plus person firm. So mid-size uh, to gain on that larger size, we continue to grow. Um, founded in eight, 1989, uh, we have our main office in Omaha where I'm based out of. And then we also have a Denver office that's also um, functioning. And we also have, uh, we're a firm with architects, planners, interior designers. Uh, we do not have any engineers in-house. And so one of the main focuses when talking with Bill about the focus this webinar was the director of innovation role. And so I want to talk about the, how I got, became that role, how it impacted the firm, and then the future of that role. And so with, in our firm in particular, um, I started here as an intern and I've always had kind of the tech bent in, in school, was always trying to find new ways to use technology, use software, use tools, uh, to, and it's always been exciting. And so that's where, when I, I came here, our, our firm has a history of 
innovating. We were one of the early adopters for CAD. When that came out, we were an early adopter for Revit. And so we've always been, we jokingly say there's, there's the bleeding edge and the leading edge. And so for us, um, it, it'd, be, it'd be fun to be at the bleeding edge, but that's, uh, we try to be just behind that, the leading edge uh, uh, for our, our firm. Um, so uh, I had that technology bent and so then as things were coming out, we, we'd be talking about cool things. And then um, being, being the intern, being the new guy, you get the, hey, I heard this was cool. Do you know about this? Have you heard about it in school? Uh, and then uh, let's look at it. Can we do that for our office? And so that's what, how it kind of started. And so then we went through and uh, there's different initiatives like, oh, 3D printing's coming out. How would that impact us? Let's look at that. And then uh, because I, I had that drive, I would go figure it out. I'd find the solutions, find some of the uh, resources online and, and, and uh, explore those options. And then as, as I started to grow in the firm, there was uh, to, I mean, I had all this technology experience. I'm helping uh, the projects. So, cause I'm also an architect, I'm a licensed architect. And so I'm on projects, I'm leading projects. I'm a project manager now. Uh, as well as a design architect. So, you know, I, I'm still doing that. And what we found that role is it's helpful is because you're still in the day-to-day -day grind. And so innovation really comes out of, I, I have this problem, I wanna solve it. Um, and so how do we solve it? We innovate. And with that, um, we found that's very valuable. So I started kind of growing, but it wasn't at the level where I could be, um, be management, but, I'm being invited to meetings and interviews. And so when I started being on interviews, you know, I'm just the guy over here that's an architect, but I'm talking about technology. And so that's from our firm. They said, well, you know, you're already doing this. How would you become the director of innovation? It gave me clout in meetings because especially as a younger architect, um, you're sent up against some very uh, more experienced folks. And it's like, what, what, are, what gives you the place at the table? And that's what that did. Um, so now I had a voice, I had insight, I was able to provide that, and that's really how the role began, and then it's been growing ever since. So now we've got a few individuals that had that innovative uh, flair, and they're underneath me as part of our innovation team, but overall, our firm is a firm of innovators. That's what we try to, to instill, is that every one of us is trying to solve problems, try to do things better, and so that's uh, unique to our firm, that we give that freedom so everyone can play and learn and explore and find what they're passionate about and apply that to design. And so the future of the role is that uh, continuing to know what's on the leading edge, you know, going to conferences, being on webinars like this, um, learning more and more and, and also re-engaging with our, everyone in our office. What are some of your pain points? What can we improve? And so we're on, we have a few subgroups in our office for BIM um, uh, based on sectors. We have, uh, we do a lot of corporate, corporate architecture, higher education, multifamily. We start having smaller groups, work sessions of each of those sectors. And then I, I sit in uh, when I can and then try to glean, okay, what's some of the things that they're hitting on and try to improve. So with that, gonna pivot over to some of the ways you can innovate in your firm. So the first one we did was 3D printing. It was, again, with that bleeding edge can be kind of costly. If you're trying to develop it in-house, uh, I'm not a software engineer. Um, I am an architect, <laughs> but I, I do like to do computational design with Grasshopper. I've done Visual Basic back in high school. So it's like, I have that the, the knowledge there, but I'm not gonna be coding everything. And so that's where being on that leading edge, I'm aware of those things we can find out how to implement them. So 3D printing came in, uh, that was a new one. It was, again, low cost point. As, as a firm, you're trying to figure out, hey, is this gonna benefit us? There's lots of discussions on return on investment. What's the setup cost gonna be? Um, so when you're going through some of these things that we show, really evaluate how's this gonna, just because it's cool and new might not be right for your firm or how it works. You really wanna evaluate what is gonna be implemented. Can we get people to use it? Um, as Bill and Nate were and I were talking, the, the hardest point with innovation is you find a tool, it's going to save people time, but then people don't use the tool because they're afraid it's going to take too much time to learn it. 
So they can't, they don't learn the tool that they're going to save time. And we, we struggle with that, but uh, how we've kind of helped with that is we have a few individuals that are those champions that want to do that. Well, they, they're on a project and then they show the rest of the team, Hey, this is how easy it is. And this is all the time it saved me. Oh, that's what it did. Oh, I thought it was this crazy thing. That's just squiggly lines on the screen. I didn't know that would actually helps you. Um, so that's been really helpful. So if you kind of identify some of those individuals as those champions, we found that's working really well. Um, so yeah, 3D printing helped with physical models, um, massing explorations, uh, and mock-ups. One of the things we found for our, we went both ways. We've done the quick masses, but we also were trying to do highly detailed models. So uh, the honestly, the 3D printing was, we had mostly during the summer when we had interns because they could quickly model those things in Rhino, Revit, SketchUp, and then we could get it ready to be printed. Um, but mock-ups, so we had an instance here where they, manufacturer couldn't get us a sample in time. Uh, like everyone's having issues getting things places these days, but they were able to send us the file. We 3D printed it. We were able to show, in this case, it was a cup holder, not very glamorous, but it was a cup holder at an event venue, but they, the owner wanted to see it. So we were able to 3D print that model and show it to them. So that's where um, if you're on that physical bond side where you're doing a lot of the modeling, it, it's a, a nice tool to get some of your models out, but there is some uptick and prepping those models. The other big one, the next one we really forayed, and this is how I actually got to be director of innovation was I, I, I went with our virtual reality and implemented it, uh, got it going, used it on projects and got other people going. And that's really what started. And it started to snowball, which was great. So the uh, virtual reality we use uh, started with Enscape. So uh, that was what allowed us to do it. There was previously, you'd have to have a game engine such as Unreal or Unity to get into VR. And then when Enscape came out, not only is it working as a rendering engine for our, all of our staff to walk through models, kick out imagery, there was also a button to go straight to VR. So now for implementation, all I showed everyone was go to this computer that we have the VR headset on, start it and click that button and people are in it. And that's one of uh, this still till this day is still one of the best and most efficient setups we have. Uh, it's uh, partly because of the development with Enscape, but people are getting in and using it. We do it everywhere from client review. So my big win was working on a uh, STEM lab for my alma mater, my high school here in town. And we went through uh, the, sp the space downstairs as a renovation and had the principal in and we're he walked through it. And the benefit with VR is people see it in real scale. It's not a model, it's not imagining, it's not looking at plans. Clients have a really hard time looking at plans and understanding space. That's where VR came in. Now everyone's on the same playing field. You see it, you experience it in real life by looking around, now you're doing that virtually. So he walked in, he's like, oh, with what we have planned for this room, this isn't gonna be enough space because some of the design changes had, ha some of their curriculum had changed to that. And so we were able to actually move the wall on the fly said, okay, put it back on. How's that feel? And he's like, yep, perfect. And so before anything was demoed, before anything was built, we had a decision. And so that's where we found in our firm, the biggest return on investment with virtual reality. You buy the headset, you buy a, a beefed up computer. VR does require a higher graphics card. So when you're ordering those machines, you do want to have a VR ready uh, card that can support the headsets you want to do. There are some options where um, it's a light, lighter version of virtual reality. So if you've seen the uh, Oculus Go's, they're a head-mounted display, uh, no tether, no nothing. Uh, those run apps on themselves. But what we found with some of the apps, they Enscape, you can be in VR with photorealism. The glass is reflecting. Everything looks like you're there. Um, and with Unreal and Unity alike. Then with um, some of these other softwares, uh, it's more of a dumbed-down they reduce the materials just because there's so much as to process. So at this moment with the hardware at hand, you're not going to get that finished quality, but you can still walk through. And so that's where the next two points, coordination, walking through with consultants. Um, in this, in this photo here, we're walking through uh, the, uh, a large performance venue we're doing here in downtown Omaha, and we're doing a coordination review. So the VR, we're looking for anything like some clashes with ductwork, uh, structure, uh, and, and what we actually found was there was some outlets that were located in the model down below the, the slab because they found that as we were working through, brought those back up to where they needed to be, and then 
got that cleaned up and continue to go on. So that's where throughout the entire process, it's not just a client facing uh, tool. It's also using throughout CDs, SD, or SD, DD, CDs, and into CA, because that's where I'm going to go in the next one. When we started again, construction administration, that's where augmented reality really came into play. You, you, we use it in design too, as we'll show here, but your life size, your on site. And in this case, we have a tablet. You can use your phone, you can use a tablet, um, maybe you can use a camera, a webcam. Uh, so in this case, I'm gonna hit the video here. Um, this is a live video stream from that web tablet. And so notice how that building, that's our project. It's like it's there, right? It's moving as we move the camera. And one of my big pet peeves, we used this in the past on an earlier version um, with another software. And it, it placed it there, but if I wanted to walk around the building, it wouldn't track me. And so this is using Unity. And one of our individuals uh, has a good background with Unity. And he actually was able to build this augmented reality viewer for us, uh, for this demo. Um, we use Unity Reflect, and now there's Unity Reflect Review. But at the time, uh, there's and still to this day, there's nothing that can do this out of the box with the Unity Viewer. Um, we're in the beta, he's in the beta group. So they've been talking about features and it'll eventually come down the line potentially. We just, you know, you know how software development goes, you don't know. But um, we were able to do this with markers placed on the ground where we, we have our base point in the model, base point uh, in real life, and then voila. And so we actually had the, the clients, the contractors walking around our project on that site and seeing it all the way through. And then with construction review, uh, same individual was on a project down in Texas. He flew down and it was a TI uh, and he's walking through and the contractor was, hey, what's going on up here? Cause they started putting in some of the stud work and some of the piping and he pulled up the model, did his target. And we, he was looking at it with the contractor over his shoulder. This is what's happening here. Oh, okay, got it. We'll go and get that done. And so, really throughout the whole process, again, using this to, it's all about communication and getting the project done, eliminating confusion. And so that's where, again, our biggest return on investment has been this um, eliminating, eliminating errors, <laughs> if you will. So kind of going through some other high level ones. Uh, the next one we explored was drones and reality capture. So um, I got my commercial uh, commercial remote pilot's license. So we can fly. If you are doing this for business, you do have to have your uh, commercial pilot's license because you are making money. If you go out and just fly it, technically that's illegal and you could get uh, fined by the FAA. But so we have, uh, we go and fly the buildings. We get our aerial photography, which has been great for renderings because it's like, hey, can we just get this shot of the whole site? Google Earth's not cutting it. Fine. We go up, we fly it, take the shot. And now we got our perfect background for our renderings. And then with photogrammetry. So photogrammetry is where you take you know, hundreds to a thousand photos uh, all around the building from different angles. And then it creates a point cloud. We take that point cloud into Revit and we model up our building. So um, we were doing an addition to my high school and we flew the drone, got all the models, and then uh, let, let uh, individual go to town on modeling up that whole exterior. Now we had the mass of the building and it was accurate. And um, I had done it as an intern in SketchUp and I had to measure the perimeter of the building with a laser tape and try to remodel off of photos. This was a thousand times easier, faster, and more accurate. <laughs> so um, again, the next step with that, with increasing accuracy is we um, invested in a Im imaging laser scanner. And so this is the ones where it's shooting out lasers, uh, it's constantly pinging distances. And then as you can see on the tablet, uh, they, you get that live view. So we were doing an, uh, an under, uh, under a retail center, there was a, a sub basement that was for deliveries. So we were getting all of that scanned in and now we have columns, you see piping, uh, they take photos. You get 360 photos as it goes. And so then you can jump in there and look around. With COVID, this was invaluable. We were able to send you know, a team of two um, because the other person with the iPad helps val validate while the other person's doing the walk. And we were able to go through facilities when nobody was there. We did in minimal time, came back to the office, and then we could go back and save us from having to go back into when regulations were preventing us from traveling, we could at least go back to our photos and be in the space. So this has been very helpful. 
Um, the next, the, the worry here is when you're dealing with clients is the level of detail. So think of how much level of detail your model is going to contain, because they'll be like, oh, well, there's a piece of crown molding there. There's a, you know, it's like, okay, we just need walls and doors for your project. So that's what we're going to model. Or if you want that, then we'll need to increase our fee. And I'm just going light, to lightly touch on this because Nate will cover a lot of it in, in his presentation, but computational design, uh, using it for automation. Um, there's Revit for, um, in Revit, there's Dynamo. And then for Rhino 3D, there's Grasshopper. Grasshopper was kind of the, the, the granddaddy of them all got started, was very easy to kind of start picking it up, implemented as you were designing. And then uh, Dynamo, Revit's like, we need this too. So they made up Dynamo. And uh, for Revit, we've really found it value on the production side because we've made some, some tools such as graphic scales on drawings. You've got a whole set. We need to put our graphic scales per jurisdictions that require it. And then, so we have our things, we made a, a script that you can then go run and then it'll apply, put those graphic scales on all the views and you don't have to think about it. We still go obviously check, um, but it, finding those automations of where, okay, we're duplicating sheets or trying to update a schedule. And so you're doing these repetitive tasks that take time. Uh, let the computer do it, get your, get your employees back to actively thinking and doing their job. Analysis optimization. So on the image on the right here, we were doing a massing for uh, a project and we wanted to see visibility to some natural features, you know, the mountains and the and um, the landscape, and we wanted to, so that way they the developer could impact rents and what type of units they put there. Um, so this was showing the blue is where you had the most views out to those mountains, and then yeah, the pink zone was where you weren't seeing them because the mountains were on one side of the building. And then it comes to fabrication, you can um, you can can automate how you turn panels or repetitive elements back into um, planar drawings or uh, for numbering panels, those types of things. There's a, a lot with fabrication you can also do. And the future really has been in op interoperability. We have all these tools. You know, if you're in a wood shop, you can grab a hammer, you can grab a drill, you can drive a screwdriver. You have all your different tools to get that project done. We have that in design. You've got all these different softwares, but then you're stuck in one because uh, that's why I need to finish the project. I need to get my documents out in Revit. So I'm gonna stay in Revit and design in Revit. Okay, but I design better in Rhino or SketchUp. So that's where this connection between, um, you've got Rhino and Grasshopper are tied. So you can do the computational design. You've got Dynamo, Revit, and on the right, there's the Dynamo player. That's what we use. So people that don't know these codes, that player and Grasshopper now has a, pl a player as well. You can just click, I wanna run this script and then you put in your inputs and it goes. And lately now there's Rhino inside and that's now a link between Grasshopper, Rhino and Revit. So we, with our designers, this has been a game changer. Now we can truly design the way we wanna design and get it back into Revit. And with that kind of high level, that's, you know, there's so much you can do and innovate, but by finding those individuals that can be those champions, you can really keep innovating your process and creating better projects, better outcomes for your clients. Matt, uh, thank you very much for that. That was a really great presentation. Um, I wanna give us, I think we have about five minutes for conversation, but I actually have just a couple of questions and yeah. uh, you know, Nate can get involved in this as well, Matt. But what I'm, I'm wondering is, um, where uh, where are innovative technologies are discovered? Are, you know, is there time that that you put to it, or is it uh, office conversations, is it conferences, and then and then how do you go about deciding what to apply? Because it sounds to me like some of these uh, technologies are bought kind of with the idea that you can apply it to a specific project. So it must be with some uh, you know profit from the office, and then you. Uh, wish in a prayer, hope that uh, it becomes a, a profitable thing. Can you yeah. talk about that? So, yeah, the, the first, oh, sorry, Nate, did I cut you off? No. Oh, um, so yeah, the, honestly, all the above for how it's how it's come. 
So it's, we have an open office and I have open ears. And so I'm, I'm hearing things and people are like, Hey, I'm really tired of this. And I, I hate how it does this. And it's like, Oh, did you know it can do this? Did you know that this tool can do that? And so we've been training people to really, yeah, it, it's, it's eavesdropping, but it's productive eavesdropping. <laughs> so um, go ahead and do that. And then with the investment if it, on our bigger initiatives. So like the scanner, we had a large project that that was going to benefit. And for, uh, it was, if we were to hire a scanning company to go and scan it, we could develop it in house and do it ourselves. And so that's where, uh, that's an example where a project triggered that. Um, but we also have uh, a small discretionary fund that's like, okay, um, we found this and I, what I do, I go and put a whole package together and we present to the partnership and it's like, okay, we found this tool. It's going to help us in these ways, X, Y, Z. And then here's how we see it apply to future projects. Here's how we see it as a return. And then, then they'll say yes or no. And sometimes they got no, they got next. It's fine. But we keep that on the back burner. And then when it happens again, or that a project comes up, we're like, hey, how about now? Can we try it on this? And they're like, yep, let's do it. And then, then we go for it. Great, great. Uh, thank you on that. Yeah, I want to double down on that uh, idea of productive eavesdropping. <laughs> I think that... Uh, that real problems are where innovative opportunities come from and that it's, it's not when you're sitting down staring at a white piece of paper saying, what can I innovate today that yes. you have a great idea? It's when you're faced with a real challenge. And often it's a challenge with a deadline of, oh, how am I going to get this done in time? Or how on earth are we going to deliver this thing at the quality they're expecting? That's when you need to step up and find a better way. And uh, I'm, I'm always uh, working with project teams to say, where are the opportunities to find a better way? Search out the better way. And uh, I, f I find those to be the most productive conversations as far as coming up with new ideas. Uh, Nate, I'm wondering if you have any questions for Matt or anything that you want to kind of uh, build off of or, or you know. Um, you, the main question I had was which, which ones how do you decide what is the right um, technology to push forward? You talked about the leading edge versus bleeding edge. I think that's a great, uh, great descriptor there. How, how do you choose which ones that you want to present to the, uh, to the partnership, the ideas that you really think you're, you're, you're ready for and are going to have that opportunity? Because there's so many things we could do. Which ones yeah. should we do? Perfect. So with that, it's, I have a weekly lunch with our R&D team. And so then we get together and we talk about what are some of the things we've heard this week as pain points or, or wins. Um, and, and so then when we start hearing some of the pain points or some, and someone will come up with, Hey, I, I got an ad on this tool, or I saw this tool or my friends using this tool. And then it's like, okay, let, let's take a look. And so then we, we take about it, you know, half hour to an hour, kind of delve into it. And then we bring that to our R and D meeting and we talk about it. And so it's like, okay, if we went down this path, is what is that it all comes down to that will people use it that's our big question so we try to answer that first will people use it and then how met, how often would it be applied so if it's a if it's you know a couple hundred bucks for a year well we'll let's let's try it out and give people the shot but if we're spending you know upwards a, a grand to several grands on this thing then it better be used um, a lot so sometimes we do the factor of our hourly rate for the individuals that'll be using it and see how much would we save, how much, how many hours would we have to save by using this tool? That's our big KPI or indicator that we use. And then I take that upstairs. I'm like, okay, if we do this, if it saves anybody, one time it came down to eight minutes. Um, <laughs> just because like, if it saves yeah. someone eight minutes, we're doing it. <laughs> and so, yeah. <laughs> What about the uh, the value creation argument? I find that to be one of the most nebulous things that uh, that architects like to talk about. Of, well, we're not going to necessarily charge more, but it's going to help us win a project, or it's going to make the project better. Uh, it's not going to save time, but it's going to make it better. Yeah. Uh, how do, how does that come into play when you guys are evaluating those opportunities? That one really comes down to the partnership and the the business development teams, and so. We'll be like, you know, I, I'll, I'll be up front. I'll be like, I can do this. It's going to take some time or they can do it. It's going to take some time, 
Are we okay with that amount being pulled or that effort being put? And, uh, and sometimes it's like, we got to keep this client. We, we want to try and win this client. And so just go. And so when we get that, just go, and we don't do it irresponsibly either. That's also, there's some trust there. And so we've developed that amount of trust that they know we're not just going to spend a whole, whole week dilly dallying, and then it's nothing comes of it. Um, so we do some smaller demos to prove that, Hey, this is what it would be look like. And then we can do further. Uh, and then that's, then it goes back to them to make that ultimate decision. Yeah. It, it actually sounds to me like it's a way you can, uh, uh distinguish uh, yourself if you're competing for a job, you know, yeah. by, by actually having you in, in the room and talking about how you can apply some of these technologies to innovate, but also to make the office more productive. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, uh, Matt, I want to give you time uh, to uh, you. make your uh, commute to that uh, meeting that you're going to. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, uh, thank you for your contribution. Yeah, thank you all. And enjoy the, the rest and looking forward to catch up later. We may be speaking about you when you're not in the room, just so you know, <laughs> okay. but it'll all be positive. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> Great. All right. Bye. See ya. So, um, Nate, um, I, I thought I'd give you the, the platform to present, and um, then you and I will have a conversation back and forth. Uh, uh, and I, well, I, I may do a little bit of follow up because I'd like to talk about ways in which you can, um, you know, uh, you know, maybe uh, a firm that's thinking about, well, how do I really dip my toes in this? That there are opportunities to uh, in, engage and embrace other people. There may be some crossover between you and I on this. So. Great. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Uh, first off, I have to apologize. I do have a little bit of a cough. So uh, if that pops up, you may have to give me a second, uh, but we'll do our best to get through it. Um, so wanted to uh, start off um, by echoing something that Matt had, had talked about and that the idea that innovation comes from the projects and that his he is still intimately tied to project work. And I would say that I am too. Um, I started, uh, really started down this journey when I was at the uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. I moved out to Seattle with NBBJ and all of my career and all of my uh, processes really happened through a series of projects. Uh, so it's never been uh, me sitting in a room by myself. It's been me collaborating with others. Uh, which I think is really important aspect of the role that Matt uh, had developed. So thinking about the idea that this isn't something that you need to uh, spin up a, a purely overhead role to, to do, but this is actually something that happens on top of project work. And it's about um, empowering people who are on the teams to make those innovative uh, opportunities come true, I think is, is really what I wanted to, uh, to capture there. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, three different tools that I think are really on the uh, on the front edge. I would say uh, one of them is definitely bleeding edge. One is the leading edge, and the other is probably somewhere in between. Um, but I think they're really, really important. Uh, and I just wanted to share what what I think is uh, going to be coming down the road. And then finally, I want to talk about the concept of hackathons. Uh, is one of the ways that we support innovation within our firm. So jumping right into that, uh, Climate Studio is a tool. It's the, uh, it's the newer version of Diva. So if anybody's used Diva for daylighting design, uh, the company Solema that makes, made Diva uh, discontinued it and made a new one called Climate Studio, which is better in just about every way, shape, and form. And I know there's a ton of ways to do daylight design now, um, but I really do think this program is, is doing it right. And um, a few things that I really, really love about it. Uh, the first thing is that it does both daylighting and glare. You get your kind of typical heat maps, which I think are really important. Uh, but when you click on a point, you get so much information. And this is where it really becomes a design tool. There is analysis of a space because you want to put a pretty diagram on a board that goes to a presentation for a client. There's analysis where you want to submit something and get a lead point. 
And then there's analysis where you actually want to design a better space. And if you really want to design a better space, you have to understand what's happening. And for me, that's what I really love about this tool is you can click on that point. You can see that it has a, a spatial daylight autonomy of 89. Okay, that's interesting. But now I can look at that, um, that percentage of area for the space throughout the, um, throughout the course of the day with the different daylight autonomy is doing. I can look at it uh, over the course of the year. Uh, similarly, I can switch to figure out when the blinds are open. This is a huge, huge aspect of daylighting design that nobody talks about. You know, we talk about how much light, is it glary, is it not glary? When it's glary, people pull down the windows. You have a uh, building that's been designed with this amazing view out the window, but somebody pulls the shades down. Now, all of a sudden, you've negated that amazing view. You've negated the energy hit you've taken by putting glass there as opposed to a solid wall. Uh, as opposed to had you done better passive design, you could have kept the shades open and all of those kinds of things. So conversations that really dig into the meat of what are we trying to get after and how can we, how can we solve those problems? Uh, it gives you the information to circle, circle back on that. Similarly with glare, you can see each of these are little pie shaped slices. That's telling you what the glare is looking in each direction. And again, when you click on one of those, you get a chart of what level of glare are you getting for each hour of the day? Uh, and then over the course of the year, when are you getting that glare? So you can see that, you know, in this case, it is mainly a summer glare and that glare happens to be uh, midday. Different buildings obviously have very different shapes. And then you click on one of these spots in here and you actually pop up a rendering and you can see a render of what the glare is doing at that point in the day. What part of the sky is actually causing the glare simulation in your eye? So now if you're going to go back and say, well, what kind of a solution do I want to design for this space? You have the information you can start to look at. And to me, that's that's really a powerful aspect of this tool. It also does a whole bunch of stuff with energy design. Uh, I'm a little cautious when it comes to architects trying to do energy modeling. I think it's just a little bit outside of our wheelhouse. So I still advise people not to do it unless they really, really understand all the aspects of mechanical design. Uh, the piece that I do encourage is for people to play with it in Grasshopper. Um, and what this is, is a tool that we built using the components from Climate Studio that allow us to measure circadian light response. Circadian rhythm is the way your body responds to uh, natural light. It's that clock within your body that tells all the hormones to do whatever, to wake, sleep, to eat, to not eat, to your immune system, all that kind of stuff. Most of it is driven by... Um, a response to light. And this tool now allows us to measure that um, using a whole bunch of validated research studies. We were able to take those methodologies, use the pieces from Climate Studio to now build our own custom tool to start to measure that. So Climate Studio gave us the building blocks to do that, which I think is amazing. Matt also mentioned Rhino inside Revit. I don't think he quite uh, gave it the weight that I'm going to give it because I think it's an absolute game changer. Uh, for us, every, <coughs> excuse me, every single project goes through Revit to get out the door. That's where it is. Okay. So that's the case. I am firmly a believer and most people in our firm would lean towards the fact that Revit is not the best design tool. It is a amazing documentation tool. It is really, really good at a lot of things, but the fluidity of design is probably not its strength. We can argue about that. Um, I think enough people have um, Rhino as my tool of choice. Other people will use SketchUp, other people use Blender, whatever your choice is. Uh, but if you just say that we want to work in Rhino for the design side, you want to be in Revit for the documentation and the detailing side, this process now allows us to be able to do that. And because Grasshopper is a piece that works inside of Rhino, you now have the ability to kind of nest them together in these little Russian stacking dolls, um, as a little analogy. So what does that mean? So that means that something that's very easy to do in Rhino and really quite dynamic, such as creating this um, feature wall of these kind of flowing scales based on coloration that came out of an image, so based on an image and the colors from that image, they were able to choose how much these pieces poke in and out of the wall. 
uh, something that would be very complicated to model in Revit uh, now is a click of a button. So you set up a little piece, you say, push this over to Revit, and it's going to build it in Revit as native Revit elements. So obviously you have to model a, um, you have to make a component in Revit, but once you've made that adaptive component, you can push all of this information into Revit. You can do the same with uh, normal things like floors, walls, windows, doors, columns, beams, et cetera, uh, really, really, really quickly, uh, which is amazing. The other thing that I think is really cool is the fact that it's bi-directional. So you could start in Revit. This is, a, uh, this is a hospital in Boston, I believe. And you can model simple curtain walls. You can take those curtain walls and move them into Grasshopper to generate a much more dynamic grid pattern from it. And then using those grid pattern uh, generated in Rhino, you can then push information back over to Revit. So not only are we um, doing that, but then you can start to create these families that have maybe a little bit uh, more interesting uh, geometry to them. And you can just make that as a native Revit element and then use Grasshopper to say, which one of these families do you want to go where? Uh, and it makes this process of creating a textured or syncopated um, curtain wall much, much faster on the Revit side. Then the, the other fun piece, which is not beautiful at all, is the, uh, the management of BIM data. Revit is an amazing documentation tool. It's super smart, but it just doesn't do certain things. Certain things that you just, you want to tear your hair out. You've got all of your furniture in its own furniture model because you want to make things lighter and easier to work with and blah, blah, blah. Well, now your furniture is in a different model from your room. So now your furniture doesn't schedule by room the way you want it to do. So now we've come up with a process where you can use Rhino to load Grasshopper. Grasshopper can then identify all of the furniture. It then identifies which room is the furniture in. It then goes and gets information from the room parameters, puts that information into the furniture parameters, and then you get a schedule which you can print out and you have all of the information together the way you really wanted it to be, uh, which is amazing. If you've ever had to do any of that kind of stuff before, it becomes super, super cumbersome and usually requires somebody spending lots of time in Excel uh, as opposed to automating it through this method. Um, so the last tool I wanna to talk about is Hypar. And we don't use this currently. I think it is absolutely amazing. I want to want to want to find a project where I can dig in and use it, but it's a little bit out there. <laughs> and um, it, th their idea is that buildings are not BIM models. Buildings are um, relationships between elements and um, functions and workflows. So they describe these elements of BIM. Uh, so things like a site, an envelope, columns, or a facade panel. Where they try to break it down as small as possible. And you can define your own as well. Um, and then you define an, a function. So this is kind of like creating a mini little grasshopper script, as simple as you can possibly make it. And that uh, script requires a set of inputs. It needs to know certain things about the model. And then it's going to give you stuff on the other side, uh, both data and geometry coming out. So in this case, if you're going to build a structure, you need to know how big your axes are for your, or the how big the grids are for your structure. You need to know the building envelope. You need to know the levels. And then from there, this is using some logic that has been defined. So this is a structural engineer. This is an architect who knows how structures typically laid out on that type of building, whatever the answer is, putting that human knowledge into a function so that as long as you know the grid axes, you know the rotation, you know the envelope, the levels, you get a consistent output of beams and columns as well as the weights and all those kinds of things. Uh, so as small as you can break these functions down, you then can start to repeat and build on those functions. Um, when you put them all together, then you start to get a workflow. So you have one function that does the location, another one that does the site, one that does the envelope, one that does the levels, one that does the floor, one that does the structure. And then all of a sudden, boom, you've generated all these things 
Uh, and it all happens super fast online, kind of in parallel. But because they're all individual little functions, you could swap out the envelope function with a different envelope function. And everything else understands the relationships and they just recompute. You don't have to redraw the entire building so you can re-slice all the levels so you can figure out the floor so you can figure out new structure. They all know the relationships uh, and just figure itself out, which is really cool. You have to build the logic in and the logic is all of the things that we do as architects over and over again. We have a process every time you get a model, you know exactly how you're going to put the floors in. Well, we just need to teach the workflow how to do that. Uh, and then we can do it in a variety of different ways. So I'm going to play a video. Um, and this is one of their, it's slightly marketing-esque uh, of a video. But I, I think it's really cool to show the potential. So here you can see their modeling environment. It's an online piece. You just go to their website. Um, and with it, you can uh, you can see all their little work, the workflows on the side. Each one of these meeting room layout, that's a function. Office layout, that's a function. So based on all of these different characteristics, it's breaking down to, well, if this is an office space, how do I lay out that office space? At this point, they're saying, let's add in a, a corridor. And so because that corridor was added, the office space shifts because the office space shifts, the layout of how the furniture within that space needs to shift. Uh, and there can be varieties and options built into the system where you can then start to choose. Um, you can do it manually or you can um, have it start to generate multiple options and then select between those two. Um, so you're seeing just a few of these things. This happens to be a space planning one, but as I mentioned, you can do anything uh, from structure to building envelope to, uh, I've even seen things for, for shop drawings of different types of building elements uh, be done with this. I think it's a really, really interesting um, workflow that they have put here. And again, you can see that it's multiple elements of a building all coming together. And then if they change a single piece, everything else recomputes, uh, which I think is really, really exciting for uh, potential changes down the road. And then yes, they're showing here that it is compatible with Revit uh, so that once you've done all of this work, you can push native families back into the Revit side, which is uh, of course where we want to be for documentation as I mentioned, mentioned previously. All right, switching pace one more time. I want to talk about hackathons. This is one of our uh, favorite internal innovation platforms. Uh, the idea is you get a bunch of really smart, motivated people. You put them in a room together with a couple tough problems, uh, a little bit of pizza, a little bit of beer, and maybe some caffeine, uh, and you just let them do something fun. And uh, you come back and, and see, what, see what comes of it. Typically, we do um, anywhere between 24 and 30 hours for a hackathon. Uh, and sometimes we will condense it down. So it's like 24 hours straight. So you give somebody a prompt on a Tuesday and then Wednesday they're presenting it uh, and you just work all through the night. We think that's a bit inhumane. So what we've started doing as of late is we'll do, uh, you get a prompt on Tuesday, you spend three 10 hour days working on it and then you present it back out on a Friday kind of thing. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the energy and the passion around solving complicated problems they're not prescriptive problems. You're not saying do this. You're saying these are challenges we face and people who are excited to work on different things say, well, I wanna work with this technology. I wanna do this. And it's kind of related to what uh, so-and-so said they needed. So let's just try it and see what happens. Um, and we get a lot of cool things out of it. Uh, so I wanted to share uh, one that we did earlier this year. We did this one remote uh, pandemic and all that goodness. Um, and so the idea was looking at how teams collaborate. Uh, back in 2019, we had this idea of physical collaboration where we'd move little gaming pieces around on a board. We had sticky notes up on the wall, and then we had some really cool computational tools that we would always go through and do afterwards. Switching to 2020, everything moved to Zoom, and then we started using uh, Mural and Miro for different um, online workflows with 
essentially the same thing we were doing with sticky notes now happening in the web. And so this is what the team ended up doing was they came up with a process where they could put sticky notes on a wall, multiple different locations. They set up a syntax where they put the room name at the top and then the area below it. Using the Miro app on your phone, it will scan those tags. It understands where on those tags different portions of text is. Uh, it will bring that text um, into a sticky note in the mural place. And then we can take information out of Miro and push it into any of those other tools. So in this case, we're taking a program from Google Sheets, dropping it in here as stickies, moving those stickies up to these little predefined levels for the building. Um, <coughs> doing a similar thing with the um, physical collaboration where the stickies come in. And now we have a little add-on that we add in here, which allows us to select the sticky notes and it will add up the different areas based on colors, based on levels, based on a variety of different things within the, the sticky notes. Uh, and so we can then push that information from this physical environment to the Miro app to then start to view it as these 3D um, stacking bar diagrams that become more interactive. They also showed a process where they could take those same sticky notes and bring it into a Power BI dashboard uh, to start to get more of these um, interactive charts and graphs that uh, different clients want to understand how all of these pieces come together. So again, not a finished product that was 30 hours, they demonstrated a few workflows were viable. Uh, at the same time, that's one of those nuggets of innovation that when we're ready to go, when we're ready to develop it, uh, it's there, we've got the energy, we've got the passion, and now we can start to put it into a project when we're ready for it. Uh, and we had a lot of teammates had a lot of fun and they learned a lot about a lot of different skills, which they're applying projects um, going forward. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up uh, and toss it back to you, Bill. Great. Uh, Nate, uh, thank you very much. I have a few clarifying questions. Um, and, and then I'll share just briefly uh, something that we'll, we'll uh, kind of look over ways in which if um, a, and you, you can certainly, we can do a back and forth on this, but uh, because I think you've been to some of these conferences, I've been to Acadia, that's the only one that I, I've been to. So it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts about them as we talk about them, but that if a person is really interested in tech, is in technology and how it might innovate their their practice and they're curious and they want to see what other people are doing that conferences are a great way of doing that but i want to ask a question about this last this this last thing that that, that you're talking about this uh hacked workflow hackathon um how did you you know what were the questions that arose to set that hackathon up was there a, a prompt was there a theme? Was it just something that by putting the people in the room, this is what they said, this is something that they saw as a problem and they tried to solve it. How did that get set up? Um, if you see what I'm asking. Yeah, so it, it's something we've been doing for maybe seven years now. Is that really? Yeah, 20, 2014, wow. Um, I had to do some math there, double check that. Um, but yeah, it's, we, had a, we had a colleague that was working for a Google startup um, and hackathons are a common practice in, um, in the tech industry. So it was something that uh, he brought as an idea. And he said, hey, you know, we should take a look at this. And the more and more we looked at it, it's actually pretty similar to an architectural charrette in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Uh, with the one major difference being is that hackathons tend to be pretty open-ended. Um, when you do them in, when they're done in the tech industry, it's, hey, come, come with your ideas, convince other people to work on your ideas, and then just go do something. It doesn't have to relate to your job at all. Uh, we tried to put a little bit more constraint on that because the firm is funding our time. So it's a, hey, let's... Let's get thought leaders together for the commercial practice and they'll talk about problems and opportunities in the commercial practice and we'll use that as inspiration to kind of kick things off so then everybody works on something related to them 
we've done one related to human performance and, and brain science. So we had a, a neuroscientist come in and talk about a few different things. We talked um, with some leaders in that area and again, went into specific tools built around that concept. Got it, got it. So and they are then demoed um, and they're presented and then there's probably a con, a con, a conversation and then a look at how these things might become uh, uh, applicable, possibly yeah. in part and possibly on the whole. Uh, th this uh, hack, hacked workflow, really interesting, both virtual and physical and how those can uh, combine and then start to generate massing is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other interesting thing I want to mention about hackathons, we there's also a um, community of people doing it within the industry. Mm -hmm. So I think most of the major cities in the U.S. have AEC architecture conference, uh, architecture hackathons of some nature or another. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say take a look at those because it's much easier just to go to an event than it is to host your own. Uh, we, we do that as well. Um, or at least we did when they were in person. We haven't done them in a while. Great, great. Um, one of the things, uh, uh, maybe Nate, you can talk a little bit more about how, how uh, you know, uh, similar to what Matt talked about, your role as um, director of innovation, how that emerged. Um, uh, you, you actually talked briefly uh, about your path. Um, and kind of like what you mentioned having open ears, but like, how, how do you navigate? Do you navigate between projects? Do you have a team? Or, you know, can you talk a little bit about how that uh, comes into play? Like, you know, I don't know, uh, what does one of your days? Well, what does it look like? <laughs> yeah, it's, that's a lot of a lot of questions at once. Um, so <laughs> it, it evolved, uh, it was it was kind of a relatively linear path at first, and that I was uh, a designer with computational skills coming out of school and they brought me in and they were excited about that. Uh, and then it was, hey, I'm gonna lead the computation efforts for our studio. Our firm is 850-ish people. So we have studios that are in the 50 to 70 range. So you kind of have you know, your group that you know and work well with. Um, so I was the leader of my studio. Then, then I was leading design computation at the firm-wide level, working with the leaders within the different studios. And then, um, then there was starting to be this idea of the formation of a design performance group within the office. And my experience with computation, and I was showing a bit of interest in uh, the human performance side of sustainability, the, the firm leadership team said, hey, do you want to be the director of design innovation? Uh, because ultimately what we want to be doing from a design side is not just designing pretty things, but designing pretty things that actually perform the way they should and make people better, make the environment better, all of those kind of good things that we always say aspirationally, but they said, hey, let's let's find a way to do this. So my role is is both the technology innovation, but also the innovation of those, um, how, how we apply those other ideas within our design workflows. Great. Uh, thank you on that. I, I have I have two more questions, and then and then we'll get to uh, to uh, I'll 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 talk about ways in which you can uh, you know maybe uh, engage that you I, mean, I don't mean you but in the rhetorical way all of us might in engage in experiences that can expand our knowledge of design innovation. But the first is is that I noticed in your presentation it seemed like there were two things that motivate you and I wonder if you could talk uh, about them one appeared to me that that data is good that the more data that you have and you can uh, derive during the design process not post occupancy but during the design process is a good thing and and this is the 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 kind of follow up to this is also that you are interested in this relationship that between schematic design, maybe even conceptual uh, design, and how that is a continuous workflow through to production to CDs. And I'm wondering if, if you can talk about if there's another um, kind of motivator uh, to you. It, it seems like those are two that I kind of gained from your conversation. You might be able to talk about those. 
Yeah. Um, so I love data. Um, I love logic and I love putting things together. I think that is definitely a motivator, but I think I want to expand on what you said though. For me, it's meaningful application of good data mm -hmm. is inspirational. Computers make generation of data very, very easy. Is the data good or is it garbage? That's a whole different question. Um, and then what do you do with it? If you just make a pretty chart and put it next to your drawing and then do the opposite of what the chart says, because either you or the client disagrees with the data, that's, to me, I, I really don't like that. I, and I think that actually becomes a challenge for us as designers is that, you know, it's always don't put something in front of the client if it's not the direction you want to go. True. But what if that's where the data is pointing us? Well, then we have a problem and it's not necessarily a problem. It's a challenge. It's a design opportunity where we now have an environmental, uh, performative, a social, some sort of a constraint that is saying, this is the direction we need to head. Now you designer figure out how this actually works with your concept, maybe even change your concept, figure out how to make this beautiful, meaningful, and integrated into the building design. I don't, I, I, agree with post-occupancy evaluation in that it builds a data set for informing future design. Yes. Um, so I do think that it's extremely important. I think that it's one of the bigger challenges we have in our firm is getting, well, one, you can't get clients to pay for it. And two, you, it's really a struggle to get them to even let you collect the data. That's a whole, whole aside that I guess I'm not um, the expert on, but Nonetheless, we need that good data so that we can validate the tools that we're using because the tools are predicting future states. And until you've validated that those tools are predicting accurately, uh, you're just guessing uh, based on somebody else's hearsay. And I think that's a um, really uh, dangerous point we're at in the industry right now is that there are a lot of tools that promise a lot of things and then there are tools like Grasshopper, like Rhino Inside, like Dynamo, like Hypar that allow you to predict more and more things. And whether or not you're predicting accurately, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. Again, I said good data. So you have to make meaningful insights off of good data. And uh, we need to validate it to make sure that it's good. A really good point. There's something that you've that you've inspired me to to sort of also to kind of bring up is it sounds to me like some of these tools have us on the verge of looking at design as being a merger between better environmental performance and actually making buildings where we can predict that environmental uh, performance, but also better social uh psychological uh, performance. And, and it sounds to me like sometimes we think about those things as being at odds, but some of the tools that we have will allow us to really look at those more as being uh, together. Absolutely. I think, uh, take a look at the well building standard. I think that's, mm -hmm. um, to me, it's, it's one of the ones that really captures both the environmental and the performative what's good for yeah what's good for people is often good for the planet and what's good for the planet is often good for people mm -hmm. sometimes there's a little bit of an in-between but i think there's there's usually a compromise in there that's good for both mm -hmm. and i think that's a program that that attempts to drive through that one um we don't see as many buildings going that way out unfortunately but i think that's uh that's a huge opportunity for clients who really want to uh, get the most out of their human capital. Yeah, that's really good, really good. All right, I'm going to quickly share my screen and uh, and uh, share this here. Um, so I, I just wanted to bring up um, here uh, 
uh, a couple of conferences uh, to learn more. Um, some of these are happening, Nate, I believe you said uh, in the next week, because uh, November's right around the corner. But uh, there, there, there are a couple yeah, I, of ones. I here. think they're all this weekend or next week, one or the other. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. They ought to they uh, they ought to space them out. Uh, but I guess they you know they could they could really you know gain their audience if they did that. But, but these are three. The season. That, yeah, yeah. These these are three that that Matt and Nate and myself spoke about because they are places where those where those individuals uh, in practice, uh, in industry, and in academia come and meet and, and, and really begin to share ideas. And some of them do sponsor hackathons that I think are great opportunities. I could see firm uh, principals come and even be just a uh, attendee, uh, but it's great opportunities to kind of share and to compare and to really understand that. So the first one is the AE Tech Conference. This was initiated in 2013. It's not the oldest one on the list here. Um, and I'll share some of the uh, images from the, the website that they have, but I encourage you to check it out, aetech.us. Um, the next has been around since 1981, was uh, started by the, uh, well, he was a founder, but one of the uh, deans at MIT, uh, Bill Mitchell, called Acadia. It's the Association for Co Computer-Aided De Design in, in Architecture. Uh, it's been around for a while um, and is, uh, I've actually been to this conference myself. And then uh, the Tech Plus, uh, which, which, which seems to be part of another conference group that's also a uh, Facades Plus. Uh, and these seem to have a lot of, of um, robust uh, applications of technology in the AEC industry. Nate, I'm not sure if you want to add anything about these as I go through them, because you have been to these, I believe, and might have some things that you want to uh, share about them. Uh, yeah, I would say AEC Tech is probably the my favorite one that I've gone to um, in general. I think the the master classes are incredibly well done. They have an A list of uh, teachers. Um, I mentioned Climate Studio as a tool. There's also Ladybug and Honeybee are two two very powerful tools using very similar engines. The developers of those plugins um, will be at the master classes teaching them. Um, they're doing some other really innovative stuff in those classes. The symposium I like because it's not overly academic it tends to be the smartest, best people doing architecture innovation in the real industry uh, talking about it. And they're pretty open about it. Um, the, I'm blanking on his name now, the, the director uh, for the technology group at Thornton Tomasetti usually does a presentation. It's their conference, uh, but it's usually um, lights out. It's just absolutely amazing. And uh, they can often get uh, Shane Berger from Woods Bagot to present there. I'm not sure if he's in the lineup this year, uh, but he usually has some very, very interesting things to say. And then the hackathon, um, I've done that one twice now and absolutely love it. That's great. That's great. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, Katie has been around for a while. It, it tends to be more co-opted from the academic side. But that's not always the case. There's some real design innovation that has emerged from uh, these um, con these con conversation. It definitely looks to uh, be uh, more. I would not. I would not call it um, uh, leading edge. I'd call some of the things there a bleeding edge, uh, and and they tend to be in a whole range. So so they're having their conference. Um, uh, realignments, and this is kind of looking at the social and the political and the environmental over the last number of years. And I'm not sure, Nate, if you can talk about uh, this conference much. I have presented at the conference twice, and I've taught workshops there three times. It's um, it's a really good networking event. Um, I would say it does a really good job at blending academia and students who are looking to do this as a career and uh, professionals who are really interested in connecting with those groups. Um, I, I would say it is 
probably the most academic of the ones on the list. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really, really good networking event, especially if you can get into the workshops because they tend to be three day workshops, which means you're working with a group of people on problems for 24 hours worth of time. You actually get to know people um, and can then, um, you know, hire them, ask them for jobs, connect, whatever the, the net social networking thing you need to do with them is. It's and, really and helpful. And it sounds to me like really become kind of uh, versant, uh, at least at the beginning, oh, with a tool that might have some other applications. And, and, and then next is uh, Tech Plus. Um, this looks like a pretty interesting conference. Um, there's a nice uh, video um, on it that I, I'm, I'm, I might reach out and share here, but I don't know if you have anything you would want to add on this, uh, Nate. Um, I've been to the Facades Plus one that Architects Newsletter puts on. I have not been to this one yet. Uh, there's some pretty big, big names there, though. Yeah, here, I'll, I'll stop sharing. I'm going to go to my screen and see if I can... Um, share the video uh, briefly here. Um, one second, and I'll reshare uh, with sound. And I think I am there, there, share, okay. And Tech Plus, a full day form and expo where design, innovation, and technologies come together to transform the built environment. We have met a bunch of interesting people. Uh, some of them already mentioned they have projects they would like us to take it for a spin. Um, Symposium is super interesting to hear what other guys, what other people are doing. So both architects, engineers, construction managers, some of the biggest construction firms that I've ever talked to were here at the event. to the forum there's some interesting uh, speakers some from the industry and kind of some parallel to the industry which is quite nice I'll stop it there, but I just wanted to show that there seems to be a lot of uh, tools that uh, Nate, you and I have been talking about, like Cove tools and other tools that seem to be high highlighted there. So it seems like there is a expo and other things that go on at this conference. Let me stop sharing and I'll reshare because there's a couple more conferences and then but we get to um, uh, see if there are any questions from the audience. And if, if not, you and I can kind of riff back and forth. Um, let me go here and go down to right here. There we go. Um, so this is uh, the digital drivers for future practice. This one is November 2nd. Uh, and um, so the other one is a uh, facades plus, which sounds quite interesting. It sounds to me like it's looking at how we innovate uh, facades, uh, but also it looks like it, it's, it's uh, tech heavy too. I'm not sure, Nate, if you want to add anything on that. Yeah, that one's, it's a good one. You just have to kind of pay attention to who's presenting and what the topics are before you sign up for it. I've mm -hmm. seen some where it looks, where they're really, really good topics and other ones where it's uh, not quite as inspirational. So just check out the, the lineup before you sign up for that one. Sure, great. Thank you on that. And then there is uh, a couple more. Um, this uh, advancing AE technology, this is one that's already passed, uh, but, but they seem to be about finding ways to uh, take uh, AEC technologies that, that can work across uh, the different uh, facets of the industries that we represent. Um, Fabricate sounds more of an academic conference, uh, and it seems like this happens every other year. Uh, but it does uh, connect over uh, to uh, Europe and the UK. Uh, there's there's a, a worldwide uh, connection with this one. Um, the next one is a uh, European base. So I guess if you're traveling over to Europe, there are some possibilities of attending conferences there. Um, and then last is one that is uh, was 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 started by um, Niels Leach, uh, which is a connection between China. 
uh, which has a, a growing, uh, uh, you know, uh, or, or has a fully grown AEC industry that's uh, robustly using technology uh, and, uh, and the rest of the world. So this is called uh, Digital Futures. So I thought I'd stop, I'd stop there, just sharing these, and then um, see if we have any questions in the chat. So it looks like we have one, uh, and this is uh, geared mostly towards uh, Matt, um, and, but maybe this can apply equally to you, Nate. Um, it says, besides conferences, where, uh, what are technology organizations or vlogs uh, that architecture firms could follow to best understand the application of current technologies um, and uh, that are ap applicable to architectural firms? So thoughts on that are there people who um, use or, or or yeah tools you know yeah i would say there's not a not an overarching venue that i go to um i would say that most of the stuff that i see happens on linkedin or twitter uh those are just the two social medias that i'm active on, uh, semi-active anyways. Um, but it, it comes down to curating the list of who you're, who you're interested in following. Um, I would say uh, Peter Mitev is one of my ex-colleagues, is very active on there, and he usually uh, follows really smart people and has a lot of interesting he has opinions, uh, whether I agree with them is different, but he, he has them and he has a lot of interesting followers. Uh, Andrew Human, uh, H-E-U-M-A-N-N -N maybe, uh, he is now with Hypar. He's also very active on Twitter and usually has some very interesting uh, people following him and people to follow. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so that's kind of my, that's my route anyways to these things is I find interesting people. Uh, I see who they follow and who's following them. Uh, and then after clicking for a while on those platforms, the, uh, uh, the systems figure out what you're interested in, which is actually a very interesting uh, exercise. I was very um, interested in seeing if I could get new topics to start popping up on my feeds uh, at the beginning of the year. And so I was very strategic about a list of things that I wanted to learn more about and see more of. And so I wrote down all the terms that I could find for them. And every day for, I think, three weeks in a row, I went into Google and I typed them in. I went into uh, my, my phone and I typed them into the search there. I went into Twitter and I typed them in. I went into LinkedIn and typed them in. And lo and behold, they started showing up in my feed. Uh, and now I have a healthy dose of those in addition to all of the uh, less um, insightful stuff that I get. Wow, you you're you're jacking the algorithm that uh, sends you newsfeed stuff. That's pretty cool. Wow, it can yeah. be done. I guess was my point. <laughs> uh, when it comes to like Bentley or Autodesk, um, you know some of these leaders, uh, Robert McNeil, uh, some of the people who are making some of the technologies. I guess they 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 they're probably less uh, letting uh, you know. Uh, practitioners inside of their 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 true r and d uh, but do they have places where they where 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 they showcase innovation um, McNeil does offer a beta of the next release of rhino um, so they've been doing that consistently uh, since rhino four was out they were offering a beta of rhino five and you can pretty much get that for free if you own the previous version mm -hmm. uh, so they do that um, they generally are pretty forward with their communications on what's coming up. Autodesk is an interesting company, uh, to say the least. You can get some good insights if you go to Autodesk University. Uh, yeah. That's their big conference they do every year. Mm -hmm. They share quite a bit about what they're hoping will come out in their software soon. Um, generally, it's pretty pretty hyped up and you have to kind of figure out what's of value and what's real um, coming from it. If you're 
in an enterprise agreement with Autodesk, um, and I'm not sure licensing wise at what size a firm starts to enter an enterprise agreements with them. We have one, we get to have conversations with uh, some of their developers and we learn a little bit about um, what's on their roadmap and that kind of stuff. And I, I would say that's uh, relatively useful because they're pretty open in those conversations. Interesting. In, 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 in interesting. Um, yeah, but of it, course, that's NDA, so I can't share that with everybody else. That's that's the fun of it, right? Yeah, they tell you they tell you a secret, but you can't share it. <laughs> well, that's I was just yeah, I'm thinking. You know, I think that that uh, what uh, Christopher brings up is a really interesting question. Um, I may see as we develop a kind of information page on this some sources that I go to. Uh, as that I frequent in order to find out things about new tools or technologies and, and how they might uh, 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 apply. I, I, I want to ask you the same question that I, that I asked um, uh, uh, Matt earlier. Um, how does your firm uh, decide what to apply? Um, you know, when it comes to innovating tools, um, you uh, you had mentioned the Amazon head headquarters earlier, and and how you how you optimize some things. It really did save money, but I would assume that it it also had a impact on the firm's workflow. Uh, I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how you decide what to apply. Like, and and it may not be you, but it may be other principals in, involved in the conversation. Um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of my question. Um, that's a really good question. And I would say we're, we're a, a large enough organization and we are purposefully flat and that there's not a lot of hierarchy and top-down decision-making. Mm -hmm. Um, so to a degree, it's, if you think something is valuable and worth a try, you can kind of go a little ways before somebody tells you to stop. Um, and you know, it's, I would say it's actually, it's harder to encourage somebody to do that than it is to tell them to stop. You know, normally people are like, oh, I don't have an innovation budget. I can't do that. And it's like, well, actually you can. No one's going to slap your wrist. Be responsible. Try something out. If it doesn't work, let people know. If it does work, definitely let people know. Um, and we'll, we'll all learn from it. And I, that's generally pretty well accepted. Um, I would say that our primary goal is to always innovate and try things on project time. You know, don't, don't just make up a problem and then solve the problem you make up. Um, it seems like every time I do that, it turns out it's not the right problem and then we have to redo it anyways. Um, so the more we can solve something on a project, at least you've helped one project team, you've learned something. The next project's probably going to ask you a slightly different variation on the question, but you know a little bit about how to get there and the answer yeah. towards them. Yeah. Yeah. And then you get enough of those questions that are similar, then all of a sudden, then you're ready to build a repeat tool um, nice. that you really want to invest heavily in. When it comes down to you know a project and it's like, hey, do we want to do this the manual way or do we want to try to build the scripts to automate it? That is often a question of who's doing it. Can that person do it or can they not do it? Um, and then it comes down to which one do they want to do and do they see value in, in building it one way or another? Um, so it's, I can't say it's a standardized process. I think Matt, Matt's company has much more of a, um, a process for it. We just kind of uh, try a bunch of things, but we're, I would say we're strategic in the way we apply and try different things. We encourage mm -hmm. um, people to find the opportunities and present them back um, about that. And we we have been talking a lot about um, you know the beginning stages of a design uh, where where you would use data. Are there times in which a project might be going through a workflow and you're at the point where you're beginning to do design development. You may have a contractor in, 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 in involved where you come into play 
or where uh, facets of the office come to play, where budgets on projects are being formed, and where digital tools can become a way to uh, create efficiencies, if I'm making sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the tools, um, innovative tools can really pop up at any stage of a project. Uh, I had a friend who was on a project they submitted, um, well, it was their spec. They submitted their spec to the client. The client printed it because they wanted to mark it up by hand, scanned it and sent it back and said, here, there's a couple dozen marks. Well, it happened to be a, like a 1400 page spec. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple dozen marks somewhere in that. And so somebody is going to have to flip through this flattened PDF to try to figure out where's the red mark. Uh, so what he did was he wrote a script that scanned the pixel values of every pixel on every page and said, is there a red pixel on this page? And if it is, then export that to a different PDF. And so all of a sudden he took that 1300 page, 1400, whatever it ended up being, and he exported the 60 pages that had comments on it. And then they were able to respond to the comments. Yeah, see, that, that's, uh, I think that's a way of using a tool to save uh, <laughs> time, money, and effort. Yeah, wow. And then for the Amazon Spheres project, unique uh, project, but nonetheless, uh, we submitted a uh, 3D model for the structural steel elements along with our construction documents. The contractor built from that model uh, but before they built it, they sent their shop drawings back. As opposed to doing shop drawings on paper, which there's no way we could have verified, they actually sent back a 3D model, which was a much, much higher level of detail version of our same model. We then wrote an algorithm that did a point-by-point -point comparison of the two models to see where the deviations occurred. And we were able to then to highlight uh, any concerns with the shop drawings um, that way. So that was, again, a CA level uh, piece. We were doing something quite interesting. Yeah, it, it sounds to me like there is quite a bit of opportunity there. Uh, so much uh, repetition, but all so the opportunity to then circle back and then find ways to save and cut costs. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not taking things as face value. Well, well. Um, Nate, I, I, I want to thank you very much for uh, sharing your experiences with us, uh, sharing your knowledge, and um, I think this has been a really great session. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Karen, uh, in particular, Kate. Uh, Kate has been, you know, the one who has cracked the whip on all of us on the uh, committee, but uh, Karen has, has served as, as, as a lead as AIA Ohio uh, president. Uh, um, and so it's been a really good thing. Thank you, um, uh, Melinda, for your leadership on, on, on this. And um, yeah, um, we, we greatly appreciate your time, Matt. And um, uh, I also want to thank um, uh, uh, well, I want to thank Matt and I want to thank Nate too. So yeah, I want to thank you both. So I think thank you for it. inviting me. It's been, uh, been a lot of fun. It's been great. If anybody wants to, to you. Yeah. ask more questions, feel free to, uh, to reach out via LinkedIn or Twitter. I mentioned those were where I'm at. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, uh, Kate, anything else? Uh, did I forget anything? No, very good. Thanks very much. Great session. Thank you as well. Okay. Have a great rest of the day and uh, uh, see you all in November for uh, AIA Ohio events. <laughs>